Welcome to Wednesday at the Well. We thank you for joining us for this wonderful Bible study series that we have entitled The Truth About the Church. We're examining the book of Acts. We have been walking through uh, from Pentecost and now today we'll be looking at Philip and his encounter with an Ethiopian eunuch. This has been a wonderful Bible study. I, I really enjoyed examining, taking time to walk through Acts in the manner we have been looking at Scripture. I don't know if it's blessed you, but it certainly has blessed me, and we thank everyone for joining us who's a part of this community, this village we call Trinity United Church of Christ. Now we have to begin with prayer, so let us go to God in prayer at this moment. Holy Spirit, we come to you asking that you would dwell in us as we examine your word this day, that we seek truth that will set us free. And may our minds be set free by your word. May our bodies search out and seek to do your will in all of the actions that we partake in. May you release our spirits from any chains that seek to keep us limited and hold us back from reaching our full potential. This is our prayer we pray on this day that you have made. In the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus we pray, amen. Again, I thank you for joining us today for Wednesday at uh, the Well, our Truth About the Church a Bible Study Series. Now, I'm really excited uh, to delve into chapter 8 today of the book of Acts. So the scripture is going to come up on the screen. I'm going to read the scripture from uh, the New International Version. I'll mix in a little bit of the message translation along with the New Revised Standard Version. One of the things I want to share with you when you are doing Bible study, it is important that you read scripture in at least three translations. Most of us don't speak Greek and most of us don't speak Hebrew or read Hebrew or read Greek. And it helps us understand what the writer was trying to say and how it speaks to us today. Because we read from translations. We speak in English, we read uh, in English, and it's very interesting to me that there are people who think that Jesus spoke English. You have to do work. That's why biblical scholars, I have great respect for them, they spend a minimum of five years studying Scripture, a minimum of five years studying Scripture, and they will write a dissertation maybe just on three or four passages as they are looking at translations and examining a variety of meanings, this is not just simply picking up the Bible, opening it up, and oh, now I understand everything. It takes work. It takes commitment uh, to understand and to apply uh, the Word of God. So we're looking at chapter 8. Chapter 8 is on the screen, beginning with verse 26 of chapter 8, in the book of Acts, it reads this way. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up, go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch. I would translate that. There was an African. There was a Nubian. Uh, there was a Hamitic brother, a court official of Candace, another translation is Kandake, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. Another translation, this African was the secretary of treasury. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. 
He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now, the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his, in his, yeah, excuse me, in his humiliation, Jesus was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, the African asked Philip, the Ethiopian asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself, about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the African, the eunuch, said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the African and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch, the Ethiopian, the African saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. That's Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. So let's get at this right now. Let's, let's delve into and chop this up here so that we can understand better what is being said, so that we can apply this. Let me first begin with maps. Coming up on your screen, full screen, you will see two different maps, one on your left and one on your right. One map is the Peter's projection map. Uh, the other map is the traditional uh, Mercator map uh, that we were shown in high school and middle school. Why am I showing these two maps? Well, the Mercator map is so old, I believe it is from the 16th century, that it did not have what we have today, better known as satellite imagery. That Mercator map that you see on your screen, the smaller one, I should say where Africa looks very small, was a map that was designed where Europe was the center because the map makers were European. So since they were designing a map where Europe was the center, Europe looked larger than every other country or, or really beyond its actual size, not every other country, but it was larger than it actually is. And as a result, all the other countries began to shrink. And that's a natural thing. It was not that they were intentionally being racist, but they were being biased because they framed the world when designing the map from the European perspective, as if the center of the world was Europe. Now look at the Peter's projection map, a map that shows the true size of the land masses or the continents across the globe. You see how large Africa is. You see how large Asia is, South America, and so on. You get a true sense of the size why is this important? Why do I bring this up? Because we have not changed the map that we use in high school, middle school, and elementary school, which gives privilege to a European perspective about what the world looks like. Because the map was drawn from the perspective that Europe is the center of the world. That is called Eurocentrism, meaning Europe is central. 
Eurocentrism, that word, that's your key word for today. It's coming up on the screen. Eurocentrism or Eurocentric. Trinity is an Afrocentric church where we privilege Africa, where we focus on Africa to get an understanding. Why do we do that? Well, one, we are African people, but two, Africa, its contributions globally have been marginalized or erased. When you read the Bible, because we privilege Europe, and we are reading the Bible, many of us, through the lens of Eurocentrism, we assume what we're reading, the people and places are Europe, which is not true. I want you to see this right here. Africa shaped the Christian mind. That point comes across. Africa shaped the Christian mind. Next point, I want you to see this. We're going to look at Afri an African shaped our faith. Actually, a whole bunch of Africans shaped our faith. From Genesis to Revelation, Africa is a central part of the Christian message. Africa is central to Judaism, and Africa is central to Christianity. This is important for people of African descent. Let me digress for a moment, but I believe you'll understand why I'm digressing. It will help us for our lesson today. Not too long ago, we recently made a trip as a church to Ghana and to London. The reason we went to Ghana and to London, one, was to connect with our ancestry. It was a spiritual pilgrimage uh, to understand not only the contributions, connections, and the resiliency of people of African descent. We went to London to understand that the British Empire becomes an empire that goes across the globe because of the resources and the labor of African people. So we wanted to make sure that people understood that the British Empire rests upon colonialism, that it could not be an empire unless it used the resources of South America, of Asia, of Africa, and subjugated people across the globe. I mention this because when we were in Ghana, we saw something disturbing. And what was incredibly disturbing to those from Trinity was when we would go by many of the African churches that might be Lutheran or Methodist denominations you have heard of, Reformed, there was always a white Jesus. There were white angels. Any type of imagery in the churches did not reflect the imagery of the people in Ghana. Now, there were some churches that reflected uh, more historically accurate. In other words, they had Africans <laughs> and said Africans shaped our faith. But we were looking at the vestiges of colonialism. And when the Lutherans came in, the Methodists, you just go on down the list, Baptists, they always presented imagery that never looked like the Africans nor did they interpret or read scripture from an African-centered perspective, but just like the map that I showed you, Europe was the center of the universe, and there was an assumption that Christianity is European, which is false. So when you are reading the Bible, you are not reading about Europeans. Now, there are some people who are from Italy we know as Rome. We talk about Rome, that's there. But all of these other countries and people are African, Asian, or Asiatic people. That's what we know as the Middle East, which is a strange term. I won't get into details, 
talking about the Middle East that we just kind of leave it floating out there as if it doesn't really exist anywhere in the middle of what. Um, but here we begin in Acts. And in the eighth chapter, we're going to see an African. But we talked about several weeks ago at Pentecost. The Bible is explicit about Africans were present at Pentecost. It goes on in the Bible at Pentecost, the second chapter. You read it for yourself. People from Ethiopia, Libya, Cyrene, Egypt... And a lot of those names are interchangeable. That means African people were present. It goes on to talk about people who are Arab and Jews. And then it makes a very explicit framing that, oh, and there were some Greeks there. In other words, people who were from far the north, uh, who were Greek and Greek speakers. It shares with us this unique tapestry of people who were there at Pentecost but goes into detail uh, that there were groups of Africans who were present. Out of 120, there were groups of Africans who were present at Pentecost. We go back a little bit uh, uh, farther, just uh, some distance, and we notice that Jesus, with Mary and Joseph, when they had to escape Herod's decree to destroy, kill, assassinate uh, the firstborn children, they had to escape where? It says in the English translation, they escaped to Egypt. Well, there was no Egypt in the ancient time period as we know it, that, that, that particular term. Uh, but it would be also important to use, you could use interchange the term Egypt with another term, Kemet. Another term you can interchange Ethiopia, or Libya, or Cyrene, or Hamitic, Ham, or Cush, or Cushite, or Nubia. All of those were terms that meant Africa. Another term that you may not be aware of that connected with Africa, you've heard it over and over again for those of you who grew up in the Catholic tradition. You've heard of St. Augustine or St. Augustine of Hippo. Let me give you the translation. Saint Augustine of Africa. So one of the earliest church fathers, African, when Jesus is hidden, they go to Africa. Why do they go to Africa? They go to a space in which they can mix in with the population. They go to the southern portion, a space where their ancestors were from because the Jews come out of Africa, led by an African named Moses. All of this right there in the Bible. And it's very interesting to me that as I'm speaking to, to a portion of the people who are online who are of African descent, here in America, people say, I am black. Absolutely, I, I'm black. But we will have people who say that they're black of a variety of different colors. Not, not everybody is the exact same color, has the exact same hair, has the exact same nose, but yet we will say that we are black. We are black people. There's nothing wrong with that because we're saying, hey, we're inclusively, we're people of African descent, but we look differently. Well, guess what? All people of African descent don't look uh, the same way. But as soon as we leave the United States, we start looking in the ancient uh, tradition. Scholars will say, well, I'm not sure they're, they're, they're black. They're, they're, they may be brown. Well, there are a whole lot of people who are brown but are also black who live in Cuba, who live in Haiti, who live in the Dominican Republic, who live in Puerto Rico, who live in Mexico and Honduras and Belize. Nobody looks the same way. But when we leave the U.S., you're black here, but then you take that same exact person, put them in a different location, and they want to make them something else. Now, my, my wife loves to tease me um, because I was, we were somewhere, I'm not quite sure where we were at the time, um, but I had a, got a scarf, that, one of those scarves that, that I got in a Palestinian scarf, 
And she joked and says, you know what, you know, wherever you go, people are going to always think that you're Palestinian. Those are some of your people. She always likes to joke about that. And we joke about her because whenever we go to an Ethiopian restaurant, people assume she's Ethiopian. And my daughter, when people see her, they, they assume that she's from the islands. Um, and Elijah, they, they assume that, that, that he is from the islands also. So, so we are black people. And so it's very interesting that, that being black in America, we say that we're black as soon as you move out. Uh oh, wait a minute, we, we can't call you black anymore. That's what I want you to understand that when you're reading scripture, whether you're talking about Philip, you're talking about Paul, we're, we're talking about Jesus, you're talking about Mary, you're talking about people of a variety of different shades we're not talking about Europeans. We're not talking about Finland and Sweden and Germany. You're not talking about England. You're not talking France. We're not talking any of that. We're not talking Russia. Uh, we're not talking Belgium. No, we're talking about people of color and people of African ancestry. So let's delve into that. So we establish that, that when you read the Bible, you need to begin to read with an imagination that does not privilege Europe, but begins to look at the Bible through an Afrocentric lens. So let's look, let's, let's get at this uh, here in this scripture. The first thing that we notice is that we have the angel speaking to Philip, this apostle who is on a mission spreading the message of Christ, who is a part of the movement called the way. That's important. We've talked about that before. The movement called the way. What is the way? The way of Christ, meaning I follow Christ. Christ is, we've gone over this before, is my rabbi. I'm a disciple of, of that rabbi. Christ is the Messiah. Uh, that I'm following the one who has come to liberate Israel, who has been anointed by God. Christ was viewed as someone who is part of the zealot movement, a uh, radical religious movement that was going to up end society. Then Christ is the anointed one, the Christ, the Savior, the Savior not of the community, but as people of faith within the Christian tradition, we say he is Savior of the world. So he is a part of the way, Philip, sharing this. And then he hears the sound of God in his spirit saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to that wilderness road the road that goes from Jerusalem, the holy city, down to Gaza. And you're going to have an encounter there. And God, of course, is right and directs Philip as he goes on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And there he encounters, and this is important. You see the word up there. It says Ethiopian. And then the next word that you see on the screen is eunuch. You see Ethiopian and you see eunuch, it's connected together. An African eunuch who works for the queen of Ethiopia. You know, that's all that packed in there. I want you to see the beauty of this that should change the way that you look at scripture forever. First, we have a person of color, Philip, who does have African ancestry. We're not going to go into all the detail of that, but he's from this region. He would fit very well in Chicago on the south side. But then there's someone from a nation, the nation of Ethiopia. The nation of Ethiopia was not a famine-stricken country. Ethiopia was prosperous. And for those of you who have a concordance, I invite you to open your concordance and look up Ethiopia in a concordance. A concordance will show you, you know, where all these words appear in the Bible. And when you pull up the word Ethiopia or, or Egypt, remember they are interchangeable. They can be very much interchangeable and there's the historical reasons why uh, that can be interchangeable. These depend upon what period of history that you're talking about. What part of, are you talking about upper or lower? Are you talking about the northern, the southern portion of this era? Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia were many times all one country and could even stretch as far down to Kenya and could stretch as far north as, check this out, Iran. That's a trip, isn't it? That you can have a country 
uh, at one point in history can be as large as going from Kenya all the way to Iran, taking over portions of what you would call Yemen or Saudi Arabia. And so the borders that we look at today, my point is this, mean nothing when you are reading the Bible. So when you look at the border, oh, Egypt, that's what they're talking about, those borders. Those borders did not function in the way that they functioned in the ancient world. So just get that out of your mind. But we see an Ethiopian, an African, from a prosperous country. Now, I mentioned this on Sunday. Often when we see the manger scene, people have a manger scene and they have baby Jesus is white. They have Mary and Joseph is white. They got the animals and they got the three wise men. I used to always wonder, you know, when I was little, I see these three wise men. I said, you know, they're black. Why is that? Here's a simple way of remembering that. What do they bring to Jesus? It's going to come up on the screen. They bring to Jesus. They bring what? Gold. They bring incense. They bring myrrh. They bring all these precious resources from the earth. Well, where do you get that? Do you go to Greece to get that? Yeah, I guess you could, but they're not known for those three things. Well, well maybe they could, uh, could they, they, they go farther north? Uh, uh, could they go up in what we consider today as Turkey? Yeah, they could, but they're not known for that. The ancient world, in the ancient world, this time period, this time period, if you wanted some gold, if you wanted some incense, some of you all like to light some incense, that's for sure, uh, you know, especially since you are involved in all kinds of other activities, hint, hint. Um, you'll get it when you go home. But uh, they, they like to light incense, you, some of you. So incense and myrrh, now this oil. Th that is uh, a product of a particular country, Ethiopia. It's not the only country, but they were known for that. And so the three wise men, the reason they are, uh, they are pictured, even in some of the most conservative, most conservative uh, groups will have the three wise men at least as brown because the assumption is if you've got gold, myrrh, you've got incense, then it must be coming from the south or an African space. Hmm. So we notice that Ethiopia was a prosperous country and this eunuch who worked for the queen, let me help you out, people pass over the queen. It doesn't say the king of e the queen of Ethiopia. The power and the leadership of a woman, a black woman, who was in control of the gold, the incense and the myrrh, but also the silver and the other precious metals that were traded, because Ethiopians were known as traders, that was traded around the world. So the sister was controlling the market. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. She was on the level of your Jeff Bezos, uh, your uh, Elon Musk, and all of your big wealthy billionaires. She was on that level because she controlled the market around gold and silver and incense and myrrh and other precious metals that Ethiopia was known for. So we have two Africans that are mentioned in the text. One who's in charge, meaning he doesn't just count, he knows how to invest. Who are we supposed to distribute this to? He's the one making recommendations to the queen. So we talk about cabinets within the presidency. He was a part of the queen's cabinet, man. But now I'm about to mess some of you up. African, who works for the queen, the queen of Ethiopia, who is the, one of the most powerful persons on the planet, because she controls the market. But it says Ethiopian eunuch. Wow. So a eunuch has been elevated in the text. Why is this important? This is important because a eunuch was a man 
who was unable to, one, reproduce, uh, did not have testicles. They were either, either removed or as a result of birth. He was not considered a man in the framing that people considered men. In other words, this eunuch was framed in the non-binary. Let me help you out. They would say there are men, women, and eunuchs. Like a third sex almost. He did not fit what everybody else said he, he should fit into. He was non-binary. He didn't fit into the orientation. His voice was high because he did not produce testosterone. He did not have any type of muscle tone and broad shoulders because he did not have the chemicals in his body to produce what people would normally associate with the design, the physiology of a man. But he was the most skilled, brilliant individual, was placed in the queen's court and entrusted with the funding and the investments. An Ethiopian eunuch, an African and a non-binary brother. Now, we, we talk about this non-binary now, but you got right here in the scripture a person who did not fit into the male-female category because he was defined as a eunuch. And eunuchs at one point were considered, there was a doctrine that said, oh, you all are, you can't come into the temple because you're a eunuch. And the prophet said, no, God spoke very explicitly. It says that, do not have a eunuch say that I am a dry tree. They are to be included in the family of God and have access to the temple just like everybody else. There is to be no exclusion from this individual, of this individual, because they are different. Mm. Now, this is June. So for those who are framed within a non-binary system, uh, and frame themselves as non-binary, I want you to see this, that the next time someone presses against you, just say, read the eighth chapter of Acts. And a non-binary person is elevated in Scripture. And if we read further, we notice that this person, this African, is working as I mentioned on Sunday, he's got a job. He got some serious money, all right? He works for the queen, the most powerful woman in her cabinet as secretary of treasury, as secretary of treasury, I'm sorry. And then we notice that he's reading the book of Isaiah. You see it right there? It, it says he's a court official uh, with Candace, queen of Ethiopians. He'd gone to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah in verse 28. He's reading the prophet Isaiah. He's reading. Most people couldn't read. The majority of the world was illiterate. This man is in the 1% category. He's wealthy and he's also literate. And he's an African and he's a eunuch. This brilliant brother listed right here in scripture. But let me help you out. He is also a Jew. He's an African eunuch Jew who's wealthy and can read. Look, look, look at all these things. It tears up our myth today. First of all, Many of us believe that Jewish people can only look one way, which is not the case. They're all types of colors, and many of them are people of African descent, not because of conversion, but because of genealogy. Wow. Then we have an African who is reading. We have been told the myth, Africans 
couldn't read. They were brought from Africa. Now you have an African right here who's one of the most powerful people on the planet, and he also reads. He's reading scripture. How do we know that he's a Jew? Well, it's two things here. One, he's coming from Jerusalem because he's coming from worship because every good Jew would make a pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem. The second thing is he's reading Isaiah. Oh, wow. That's why I love this scripture so much, because it debunks so many myths about who we are. And I believe that this should be this should be standard reading for every person in a Sunday school confirmation class. If you want to be a minister, you need to be able to reference this specifically because there's something very important that you will witness here. So Philip is given this assignment to find this person. He is then taken up into the chariot. He explains to the Ethiopian what he's reading. He gives an interpretation and tells him the story of Jesus, that Isaiah is talking about Jesus. And the Ethiopian says, hey, I want to be baptized right now. And he is baptized. He comes up out of the water. Philip has been taken away by the Spirit, but he goes home rejoicing. Now, let me help you out. I already mentioned that at Pentecost, there were Africans who were present. So there are Africans who are already followers of the way. The movement is spreading, but it's not like a viral movement where things overnight, you have a million people. This is spreading because people walked and rode on mules and horses and camels to get from place to place. So travel, you know, it, was, it would take a while for you to get from one place to the next place. But what's important about this gentleman here is this Jewish person, this person who is practicing Judaism. He, he is a believer. He reads the Torah. He knows the prophets. He then goes back to Ethiopia and shares what he knows. Why is this important? Because Ethiopia as a country, you had this large portion of Ethiopian Jews, and then as a country, Ethiopia adopts as the national religion, the state religion, it becomes Christianity. They become followers of the way, but they're not like we are, we're Protestant. And I really wish that we practiced as Orthodox Ethiopians. Because if you watch an Ethiopian practice, the way that an Orthodox Jew practices and an Orthodox Ethiopian practice, it's almost it's identical. Because they are coming out, they're Judeo-Christian. The way that they have meals that they call seders, uh, their, whole, their calendar, their liturgical calendar, is, it follows in many ways with the, the Jewish calendar. It's very interesting. So the nation of Ethiopia becomes a nation filled with people of, who are followers of the way because an Ethiopian eunuch, this non-binary brother, who was incredibly intelligent and trustworthy and worked for the queen, shares his story. Then there are those who were at Pentecost and they share their story. And there are just so many other wonderful stories about Ethiopia and its connection to Christianity. But the oldest, let me say it again, the oldest Christian tradition, continuing Christian tradition, the oldest continuing Christian tradition, the oldest church on the planet is not the Roman Catholic Church. Ethiopians, people were practicing and followers of the way long before anyone in Rome was practicing. If you really want to talk about ancient Christianity and you want to have a true perspective of the faith, you also need to examine Ethiopia, Egypt, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church, and as they say in, uh, in that tradition, you need to examine the Gospel of Mark, who they say is the African writer of the Gospel. These are things that I want you to know about your faith, the truth about the church. You practice an African tradition, syncretic in many ways, 
but you practice an African tradition that Christianity has been in Africa so long, it is now considered to be an African traditional religion. Scholars are now framing it that way. They said it's just been there just so long. It's been there longer than any other place in any other country. But we have to learn this if we are to learn the truth. And when you learn the truth, the truth will set you free. Thank you for joining us tonight, this day, for Wednesday at the Well. If this message has been a blessing to you, maybe there's somebody in your family that's raised questions about the connection in reference to Africa and Christianity, please pass it on, share it with somebody. I hope that uh, it will be a blessing to someone else. But we are an African-centered church. We are a liberation-centered church. Uh, we believe in scholarship. We believe in people reading just like this Ethiopian. Uh, we believe in investing in our community. We believe in being a follower of the way, following Jesus Christ, not just giving lip service, but in the manner in which we practice. So we thank you for being with us on, on this day. And before I pray with you, I want to give one little announcement. I'm excited that I'm going to see you very soon in August. I hope that you have it on your calendar. You place it on a magnet on your refrigerator. But the last Sunday in August will be when we open up the church. Make sure that you are on the mailing list, the email mailing list. Numbers are coming up on the screen and an email to make sure that you will receive our alerts to receive information about how you can participate so that you could be one of the individuals to be with us in worship. We're not gonna have everybody just rush up in here. There will be protocols for you to show up to worship. And we wanna make sure that you have the information before you come to worship and there will be a limited number of people, a limited number of people. There will be a limited number of people who will be able to come into the sanctuary of that first service. But we wanna see you. We will also set, we've also are setting up other opportunities for us to worship together. Like I'm uh, taping uh, this Bible study in church. We're gonna have space so that you can come and be with me when I'm taping Bible study. When I'm taping for Sunday prior to when we open up, we're gonna have space so that you can come and be with us. It'll be like worship. You just see some cameras uh, around, arranged in different ways, but it will be worship in church and I look forward to seeing you. And on the first Sunday in August, we will have an outdoor worship experience we're looking forward to. But thank you again for being with us. I pray that this message enlightened you, inspired you, and blessed you. That you learned a little bit about the truth about the church and how an African shaped our faith. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we ask that this word will not fall on, on ground that has not been tilled by you. That it will fall on fertile soil and it will take root and grow and bless others who need to hear an inspiring and informative word. We thank you for this time together. And just ask, O oh God, for your blessing this day. In the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for Wednesday at the Well. I look forward to seeing you next week. And please place on your calendar, we will be opening up church the final Sunday in August. That is the fifth Sunday. You need to be on the mailing list. You got to know the protocols. You're going to have to sign up. We're not having a whole bunch of people just rush up in here. Make sure you're on the list. Get on the list. I'll see you next week and look forward to seeing you this Sunday. Hey, it's Father's Day and it's Juneteenth. We're going to have a great time. I hope you're ready for a tag team message on this coming Sunday. God bless. I'll see you next week. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and running over. Shall the Lord give into your lap. We, the Village of Trinity, are committed to lifting up Christ, engaging our community, and celebrating our culture. Today, your gifts of tithes and offering will allow the work of Trinity to continue 
as we seek to provide ministry and resources to those who are incarcerated, ill, hungry, hurting, and whose backs are against the walls. There are multiple ways for you to support the Ministry of Trinity with your tithes and offerings. You may give through our Secure Give application. You may also text to give by dialing 855-781-8384. You can also use our cash app, dollar sign, Trinity UCC, or use our website. With a few easy clicks, you will be well on your way to support this ministry. Also, our First Fruits Direct Draft Program allows you to make your church a priority. And if you prefer to mail your gift, simply send your tithe or donation to 400 West, 95th Street. Thank you for supporting Trinity United Church of Christ, the greatest church this side of the Jordan. <laughs>